Next up, we have a panel on artificial intelligence. And I don't know if any of you play chess, but just bear with me uh, a few seconds. But there is a board game which is infinitely more complex than chess, and it's called Go. And in 2016, there's a computer called AlphaGo, which is powered by Google. It's one of the world's most intelligent machines. And when it beat Korean Lee Sodol in 2016, it was watched by more than 280 million Chinese viewers. And it was generally described as China's Sputnik moment when it came to artificial intelligence. Now, the UAE is obviously also doing a big push towards artificial intelligence. It is the first and still the only country in the world to have a minister of artificial intelligence. And we're very excited that His Excellency Omar al Alama is joining the next panel on artificial intelligence. So on that note, I would like to welcome His Excellency Omar al Alama to the stage. And the panel will be moderated by Dr. Eric Daimler. And also joining them will be Jamila Sfor from the Abu Dhabi Investment Office. Please welcome His Excellency and the next panel to the stage. Thank you. Good afternoon. So AI uh, is going to affect every industry. And in uh, 2025, which industries will be transformed the most is something we're going to be uh, talking about. But we read about uh, AI in the popular press uh, quite a bit. It's every, every day getting uh, quite a bit of hype. And I'm going to say that it's actually underhyped. And I'm not saying that just to be controversial. I'm saying that as uh, business becomes more uh, commoditized, businesses can differentiate themselves by the degree to which they will either collect data or process data uh, in a proprietary way. So it is in that sense that every business will become an AI business. And that doesn't mean that every AI deployment will be successful, or every AI a digital transformation will be successful. So what we're going to talk about today is we're going to talk about what's holding AI back, and then how to fulfill on the promise of AI. Uh, so Rachel told me that about uh, we have about 300 people listening and in the audience. And that means we'll have about $3 billion wasted in you AI uh, in 2020. So if you look to someone on your left and look to someone on your right, you'll see that one of them, or possibly you, uh, will have your AI project fail in 2020. So we're going to look at uh, applications of AI and how uh, government can support that. Uh, here are some of the logistics. We're just going to have some important questions for the panelists, uh, and then we'll get into a little bit of a lightning round. If there's any sort of follow-up questions, I will certainly be available on the panelists you know, as, uh, as, as, as appropriate. And then in the program and online, there's quite a bit uh, available about my distinguished panelists. So I will, uh, I will allow you to, to read about their impressive backgrounds and their impressive credentials uh, using those resources. We won't spend time on the panel uh, for that among the distinguished panelists. So let's get to it. So AI is going to affect every industry. Uh, and so in 2025, Your Excellency, which industries do you think will be transformed the most? You know, I think making forecasts is the hardest thing to do because you're either 50% right or 50% wrong. You can never be 100% sure. But I am going to say this. Um, I do genuinely believe that AI is going to impact every single industry. There are industries that are a lot more mature uh, in terms of AI deployment just because the tasks necessary to get the work done are very repetitive, are very uniform, are process oriented. So AI is going to do a lot better there than tasks or jobs where what is required is a lot different and a lot more complex. What I'm also going to say is uh, I do believe that there is going to be a transformation in the nature of how we deal with these systems. And I'd like to give a simple example of how technology actually helps improve and create jobs rather than displaces jobs. If you looked at when ATMs were being deployed across the US, for example, 1985, there were 60,000 ATMs in the US, and there were around 485,000 bank tellers. There was a plan to increase the number of ATMs across the US. So 
within the, the time span between 1985 till 2002, the number of ATMs increased from 60,000 to around 352,000. So drastic improvement increase. Many people might expect that that would have led to tellers losing their jobs because ATMs are a lot more efficient than tellers. But what that actually led to is the number of tellers went up from 485,000 to around 527,000 in 2002. So the, the growth of teller jobs actually increased even in tandem with the increase in the number of ATMs. So the nature of jobs is going to change. The efficiency is going to be there. The biggest risk is not in which sector AI is going to have the biggest impact. It's how governments respond to the dis displacement. Mm. Because once you reach a certain value proposition where the deployment of AI really is much better than having a person in the job, then it doesn't make sense to put that person in the job. Because think about it this way, as a country, whether it's the UAE or the US or China, you're competing on the global front. And if you're in a company as well, then you have profits that you need to you know, reach too. So if people stay without jobs, it's going to create social unrest. Looking at AI, we need to really look at the social con context of AI and also monitor the jobs being lost and displaced and understand where people currently have the biggest risk of losing their jobs. In the US, for example, you know, bus drivers or truck drivers are the biggest threat right now in terms of AI deployment. 16 million people will lose their jobs if autonomous trucks become mainstream tomorrow. What the US government needs to do is try to understand how they can reskill them and retool them in tandem with deploying you know, autonomous trucks because it increases efficiency, it reduces costs, it increases safety, so on and so forth. So the job of government really is to try to manage both. I do believe that in sectors like legal, for example, work, AI is going to flourish. I do believe in medicine, for example, diagnostics is not going to be done by a single human being in the next five or seven years. So AI is going to have a lot of good there. I do also believe that there's a lot more social jobs that will be created. So the same way that we see, for example, social media jobs today, the same way that we see jobs that include us dealing with each other, whether it's sale, increase in salesmen that are able to convince you rather than, or, or entertainers, for example, or chefs. So I do believe that the experience side and the social side is going to see an increase in jobs. Thank you. Uh, Jamie, you, you have a, a, a context that allows um, a, a broader, uh, a, a broader view uh, often of, of AI, a broader context of that. Um, sure, thank you. Uh, so I'd like to actually take us back perhaps and comment on um, what types of AI are we, are we are seeing today. So today we're mainly working with narrow AI or weak AI. There are, of course, uh, within the future, you'll see general AI and super AI, which is what we see on TV. So most applications, which is narrow AI, we're mainly working with a single task application, such as autonomous driving, chatbots, etc., that are being used. I believe all sectors, as His Excellency mentioned, will be affected, will be affected also differently in, in the speed of adoption. Um, if, you know, if, if you have a, a magic, I'd say, stick, I, I'd probably bet big on the healthcare sector, the uh, transportation, the financial sector, which are process heavy, AI probably will do wonders because there are data in there. There's data in there. There is a processing power and there's a huge number of automation and transparency and efficiency that can be affected. When we mention AI, I think it should be always coupled with connectivity such as 5G or IoT in addition to data because we've, we all of us have heard actually data is the new oil um, sentence, but Literally, data is what ignites or actually is the core of uh, what AI and uh, Internet uh, connects. So ultimately, I'd say focus on these three sectors. In addition to this, there are many more. Sectors that probably will not be as um, adopt AI as fast, perhaps the more traditional sectors, uh, education or, um, you know, typical or perhaps, you know, construction where we still actually lay a brick by brick. 
I, I, thank you. That uh, you know, I think Your Excellency, when you you give us examples about uh, changes from automation, I think uh, of many of the examples I used when I was in the U.S. federal government under the previous uh, administration. Uh, I was asked many of these same questions and gave uh, similar responses, similar stories. That the the radical increase in productivity can often drive down the price and then increase demand. Or it can move jobs in a way that we just can't predict. No one would be able to predict app developer from 2005, right? And, uh, it, it's, and, and, and in the issues of industry adoption, I just think it's not necessarily um, an issue of, of which, but it's often when. Today, these industries, tomorrow, other industries, in what degree and even how, yeah. So, Your Excellency, what, what if you, looking from the government perspective, would you say are the underinvested uh, industries in AI, the, indus the industries that uh, either don't have enough capital deployed from, from external sources, from investment groups, or, or don't have enough energy put into them uh, from governments to enable uh, AI transformations? I'll take that question and spin it a little bit differently, I think. Um, it depends on which government you're talking about, <laughs> right? But um, one issue I think that's prevalent globally is that we're not investing enough in education. Mm. If you look at the educational systems that exist globally, we are taught what to learn, not how to learn. So as individuals, if, for example, something new comes up, we can't actually reposition ourselves to meet the criteria of these jobs or to learn the skills necessary because in school, in, you know, in general, people are taught how to memorize content and then try to you know, remember it and, and write it down in an exam. There's also this other issue of, if you think about what the education system exists for, is to prepare generations for the jobs of the future, to make sure that the labor market is continuously getting a new you know, funnel of, of talent that's coming in. Link that with, for example, a statistic I read from the Institute for the Future, where they talk about 85% of the jobs that will exist in 2030 do not exist today. That statistic proves to us that we need to give people skills that will make them agile in the job markets of tomorrow. What governments need to do is understand how do they have or how can they have the most agile workforce, the, the most agile individual that's able to go into jobs, whether it's AI today or anything else that might arise in the future. Because the way that AI is going to transform our lives is some people are going to be optimized by AI and some people are going to be replaced by AI. Now, when you're replaced by AI, there is another job, but can you actually fulfill the need that is necessary in that new job that's created? So as you said, app developer did not exist in 2005 or even the 80s or 90s. But you know, was, were we able to reposition people that were normal coders or people that were in other spaces to become app developers? Yes, we were. Could we reposition taxi drivers to become social media influencers? No, we can't at this point. Maybe one of them is lucky that he has it naturally, but most of them don't have that savviness to understand how to rally people and to get likes, etc. So I really think that there needs to be an increased investment, first and foremost, in education. Second, I would say, if you look at what these systems are going to live on, there are certain foundations that the government needs to actually carry its own weight and invest in. The infrastructure necessary, so compute for example. Compute is something that requires billions and billions of dollars to be put to ensure that AI startups, AI applications can be used on. And government need to put a lot of money to ensure that the infrastructure is available for these companies to thrive and for them not to have this big burden of entry, right? Even data collection for example. So the Abu Dhabi government, I think, is very wise in putting these infrastructure elements. But also, there's another element to this that I think needs to be looked at. Every self-driving car startup, so if you start a self-driving car startup today, you need to go and collect all the street data yourself. So you need to start not from where Google's Waymo has, has ended, but from where Google's Waymo started in 2004, 2005, right? And that data collection uh, process takes a lot of money, takes a lot of time, and someone has already done it before. I really do believe that governments need to invest in creating this baseline of inputs or baseline of data mm. that can allow many different companies and many different innovators to come and use it in a different way to provide a better service. Hmm. That needs more investment from government. I do believe that government needs to do a lot more there. And that will also increase 
the uh, appetite for startups from around the world to come to these governments. So the UAE being one of them, you know, if you look at the city level, Dubai and Abu Dhabi, both looking at that uh, there. Finally, I think there needs to be a lot more investment in understanding the policy side of things. It's easy for us to deploy policies. You know, anyone can sit and write up a policy and decree it into law over you know, the course of a month. But because we don't understand these technologies well enough, because we have not dealt with them long enough, being irrational or being quick in taking a policy decision might make you unappealing to the startups or to the talent. So I think there needs to be a lot more investment in increasing and continuing the policy discussion and also researching the impact of policies on this whole space. Because there is a lot of good that can come out of this. There are some challenges, yes, but we should not hinder the innovation of you know, the, potential, the potential we can get from this technology by being very fearful of the future. Uh, that was a lot of content in there, Your Excellency. <laughs> was, I, I, you know, a couple of things I could take away. You know, so what, is, what is different about AI than different other automation technologies of the past? And I, and I think it's the abruptness of change. You know, we need to respect that uh, in the past we could retrain people, uh, and now it's just going to happen. Once digital technologies work, they work at a, at a huge scale. Another is your education comment, and, and uh, you know, as a former professor, I can advocate for a particular direction uh, for the UAE and others, which is, uh, uh, while more math might seem better, uh, I would say a, a geometry, trigonometry, even calculus has more to do with our ancestors who were farming and doing machinery, and category theory is the mathematics of our digital tomorrow, we'll say. Category theory, you can remember that. Uh, uh, Jamil, uh, uh, to you, so you, you look at companies all the time and you come from it from a, from a particular place. Where do you think the industries uh, that are underinvested in AI, both the traditional industries, and where do you think the Abu Dhabi Investment Office uh, uh, is best placed to support the growth of some of these uh, industries? That's a great question, Eric. So as Abu Dhabi Investment Office, we are entrusted to continue to focus on the great growth and innovation Abu Dhabi and the UAE has been doing on a trajectory. They have invested in great infrastructure for decades. And what we do is we look to attract all sizes of companies, all sizes of businesses to come and innovate and infuse the economy to become more of a knowledge-based economy. What we focus on in Abu Dhabi is the next wave of evolution is to enable an ecosystem by attracting anchor companies and startups to come and use the UAE and Abu Dhabi as a test bit. Um, you know, you always need to kind of push the envelope, do the greater good for humanity, come and invent and innovate in the UAE, in Abu Dhabi. We are close to the regulators. We have actually the AI minister just right next to us. So we can, we can actually look at policies, at ways how we can improve things um, and start probably much faster than anywhere else in the world. And uh, so we offer cash and non-cash incentives. We offer coaching. We offer an ecosystem. They can capitalize on the great infrastructure that we have. Uh, use Abu Dhabi as an expansion ground, ultimately. And I think traditionally, if we want to look at industries that flourished, it's the industries that pushed the boundaries and envelope. Uh, we are right now looking at number of technology companies. A large number of them are AI-based uh, with others. And we look to create a platform because as, there are more, as there's more data and we need to actually process it faster, we need to clearly create a proper platform for industries to advance in the healthcare industry, in the uh, transportation industry, in smart cities, for example. So transforming um, artificial, narrow, narrow artificial intelligence into ambient intelligence and creating that ecosystem. Thank you. For, thank you for that. You know, the, the, uh, one of my former colleagues, Kai-Fu Lee, does a great job of setting up this uh, dichotomy of, of AI superpowers, uh, you know, China and the U.S., right? And, and I just think, well, where does that leave everybody else? Uh, so a, qu a quick question uh, for, for you both, starting with Your Excellency. If, uh, if you look back from 2030, uh, which countries do you think will be the leaders in AI or have emerged in AI, other than the U.S., China, or the United Arab Emirates? So, you know, I, I end up sitting on panels with Kaifu quite a lot, and he's a very intelligent man. Uh, we do have a different point of view, uh, but I think we, we do try to say the same thing. 
I don't believe that there is going to be a war between um, China and the U.S. in terms of AI um, expansion, AI creation, and AI export. Because the way that technology has evolved historically has always been multiple players across multiple regions, right? If you look at even AI today, in robotics, you know, or, or even RPA, for example, robotic process automation, which some people consider as part of AI, but if we consider it within the same family, Japan, for example, is far ahead to the U.S. and to China. In you know, industrial robotics and AI for industry, uh, Germany is far ahead to China and, and uh, the U.S. as well. What's going to happen is, I think, there are going to be hotbeds of excellence uh, for artificial intelligence throughout the world. And there are many emergent players there. You look at the UK, you look at the UAE as another player. There's, you know, Singapore as well, definitely, I think, as a country that's going to be leading in this and emerging. What we need to understand as well is the type of talent that is coming and working in this field is very different to the talent that used to come out from other sectors. Because this talent can work virtually, they can work anywhere, the digital nomads. So they can work in Abu Dhabi and cater to China, for example, right? They're very well paid because they're in very high demand. And at the same time, they look for quality of life because they're very good, well-educated. Mm. So they're not factory workers, they're not blue-collar workers, they really are high skill talent. So the countries that will attract these talents the most are not just the countries that are throwing the most money at this, but the countries that can offer a good quality of life, that can offer good mobility, that can offer the ecosystem and the environment, whether it's the data environment, whether it's the infrastructure necessary for them to work. And as well, uh, gives them the access that they need to policymakers, give them the freedom that they require, and so on and so forth. If we look at that as a fundamental requirement for these talents, then I think the UAE is probably among the top countries. The World Bank and LinkedIn actually recently published a um, report on global AI talent flows. They talked about global talent flows, but then there's a section on AI talent. And they talked about countries that have the highest net inflow of, of AI talent. And you know, every time I, I speak to someone about this, they expect that China or the US to, to be you know, uh, number one. Which country do you think ranked first on that report? This was the UN report. No, right. this is the World Bank and LinkedIn. World Bank. Have this platform, it's called the Global Talent Flow Platform. What is it? Who do you think? Singapore? Germany? It was the UAE. So the UAE had the highest net inflow of AI talent. But why I think what I'm saying complements what Kai Fuli is saying, in terms of sheer number of talent, so for example, sheer number of AI coders and developers, China and the US are going to be number one. China graduates over a million engineers per year. That's more than the population, the Emirati population of the UAE, right? Or, or you know, a little bit less. But what's going to happen is they're not all going to stay in China. They're going to go to other geographies. India as well is going to be a big creator of talent. The US is the same thing. But these people are not all going to stay within these markets. And it's up to markets like the UAE to capitalize on the inflow of this talent to build economic returns, to build solutions that make them you know, cutting edge, and to build clusters and specialize in certain domains of AI whether it's you know, applying AI in specific fields, the same way that we did with the airline industry, for example, in terms of international airlines. Today, the UAE has a Tahad and Emirates, and you know, no one really has anything similar at that scale. In logistics, for example, and uh, maritime trade, DP World and you know, the other players that we have in the UAE operate 68 ports around the world. So we found our niche, and we really bet big on it. The same thing needs to happen for artificial intelligence. And if we do that, I do believe the UAE is going to be one of the leaders. The final point I'd like to make is it is imperative for us to continue to have initiatives like what Jamil said over here with regards to creating the ecosystem, investing, creating both cash and non-cash incentives, and really creating an environment where these people can meet like-minded individuals. So what's happening in Hub 71, for example, in Area 71 in Dubai, creating a place where they can actually try their technology rather than just come and fight with the regulators to try to have you know, a second to talk. And that's what really is necessary, I think, moving forward. It's terrific. Yeah, I think uh, that the, the UAE has a fantastic place to play in the traditional industry transformation. And that's where even in Kaifu Lee's construct of superpowers, I think the UAE could emerge as, as a leader. And as you're saying from the UN report, it already is. Yeah. Uh, Jamil, same question to you uh, uh, in the short time we have left. Wh wh which, uh, if you're looking back 
uh, uh, from 2030, which countries other than the UAE, the US, and China uh, do you think has emer have emerged as leaders? I think, honestly, there's, um, the minister has, has said it all pretty much, but I'd say any country that is, that is nimble enough to uh, advance its policies to become more friendly um, and will push the envelope to, for innovation to impact humanity and make the dent in the universe will be ahead of everyone else. So size matters, correct? Quality matters, mm. but also speed. Um, so I think this is where the UAE has been, you know, uh, very adaptive and robust in its thinking. And similar countries will have to adapt similar ideas. That's a fantastic summary for the UAE, quality and speed. Yeah, we, we, have, we have that. Um, uh, last question then. Uh, so do you think, looking back five years from now, do you think AI industry leadership will come from existing large firms or from emerging companies? <laughs> I don't take all the time left, so let him stop. Repeat the question again, please. Looking back from 2025, do you think industry leadership in AI will come from existing large firms or from emerging enterprises? I believe both. It's a combination of both. So large firms really will develop, will uh, have the data, which is critical to, uh, for AI to work. I think small firms will be more nimble, faster, will push the envelope. Uh, but I'd like to actually take us maybe a step back and say um, one of the critical things is what roles will be available in 2025. So there is a great World Bank um, uh, you know, uh, sorry, World Bank report that says there will be 200 million new jobs, net new jobs that will be created by 2025, focusing on creativity. So AI will actually get rid of all the, um, I'd say, um, automated jobs, uh, sorry, will automate a lot of jobs or mundane jobs, and we will have different types of jobs. These will be created mainly with startups that will push the envelopes and uh, that will be acquired by large companies. <laughs> <laughs> Your Excellency, do you have any last words? Yes, uh, I'd like to reiterate as well that I do completely believe that both big companies and small companies are going to play a role. But uh, what we need to look at is that big companies in general tend to be risk averse and tend to try to do things as they are. In the AI space, especially in the AI space, there needs to be some risk being taken to try something new. And I think that if you look at, for example, some of the ethical dilemmas, some of the issues that some companies are worried about, I do not think that they are going to experiment the same way that, for example, you know, startups can do that. And I'll give you one example to conclude this remark. Um, there is a big debate today on facial recognition, right? So Google does not use facial recognition within Google search. So you, when you go and input an image in Google search, it does not recognize the face. It tries to find patterns between both Im this image and another image that's online and gives you some suggestions of whether this image exists online or not. There's a Russian uh, alternative to Google, I think it's called BZR or BZF or something, that has switched on facial recognition. And you can put a picture of anyone on that platform and to find that person across the whole internet. So if we input your picture, we can see videos of you, even though it's not the actual picture. We can see other images of you with your friends. And that really created an outcry for privacy. It created a lot of issues when it comes to ethics. But it created an opportunity for law enforcement uh, you know, uh, agencies to be able to input pictures of criminals and actually find out who that person is. So you're able, instead of putting, a name and getting a picture, you're able to pick, put the picture and get a name. Big companies will never experiment with things like that, and they will never actually do them, because yes, there are issues, there are moral implications, but sometimes, if you look at the greater good, someone might come and say, we need to have this kind of thing come out. So I do believe that pushing the envelope is going to come up from startups. Sometimes there needs to be a regulation to stop them, because you know there are certain limitations that we need to allow them to go to, and, and we need to stop them. And I think that the big companies are going to keep on perfecting the, the existing solutions to really make them a lot better than what exists uh, in the startup space. And they're going to be far, far ahead 
in that front because of the amount of data, the aggregate data and talent that they have. I, I think uh, uh, we now have the nucleus of a whole AI conference right here. So uh, thank you for this rich discussion. Thank you all for listening and participating. This has been fantastic. Thank you. Thank you.